the matter? What is it? It's another case for Nick Carter, master detective. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective, presented by the three great Linux home brighteners, Linux clear gloss varnish, Linux cream polish, and Linux self-polishing wax, created by Acme, America's great producer of fine Acme quality paints. <laughs> Today's curious adventure, Mind Over Murder, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Missing John Doe. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick Carter found out who John Doe really was and who was behind the murders of the two men John Doe thought he had killed. But first, here's a tip for good homekeeping. Millions of American homemakers have discovered how Chemtone, the miracle wall finish, keeps their walls fresh and lovely. Now they're discovering how the three great Linux home brighteners bring sparkling cleanliness to furniture, woodwork, and walls. Linux clear gloss varnish gives lustrous, longer-lasting protection to every wood and linoleum surface. Linux cream polish renews the sleek, gleaming beauty of fine furniture. And Linux self-polishing wax lends rich, satiny loveliness to any floor, wood, linoleum, or tile. Take the modern shortcut to new home beauty with the three great Linux home brighteners. You'll find them all at your hardware, paint, or department store. Your headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish. And now for today's mysterious adventure with Nick Carter. Today's story starts in Nick's office as Nick and Patsy are interviewing a stranger, a young man who has just called to consult Nick. How did you happen to come here? Well, I asked a policeman where I could find a good detective, and he gave me your name. Suppose you tell us what's bothering you. Well, three mornings ago, I woke up in a strange bed in a strange apartment. Until the young lady whose apartment it was told me, I had no idea where I was. Well, judging by the bandage around your head, you must have had an accident. Was that before or after you woke up in this strange bed? It must have been before. I don't remember anything about it. The girl whose apartment it was told me she found me on the steps of her apartment house last Friday night. Or rather, Saturday morning as she returned from a party. Well, she saw I was injured, so she managed to get me up to her place and called her doctor. Well, he said my injury wasn't serious, but I had to be quiet for a few days. So she let me stay there for the night. But the next morning, even though I was able to answer her questions, I I knew nothing about myself. I had to tell her something, so I invented a name, and I told her some story about uh, being from out of town, having had a bad fall, and so on. What name did you give him? John Powell. That name doesn't mean anything to you? No, I just picked it out of the air. What makes you think you may be a criminal? This. Look. (gasps) Good grief, Nick. Look at all that money. Yes. There's over $10,000 there. And look at this. Oh. Well, diamond lavalier. One like that, even though it's pretty old-fashioned, must be worth at least five or six thousand. And those diamond eardrops are pretty special, too. Did you find anything in your pockets that might help you establish your identity? No. The suit I was wearing the night she found me was bloodstained, so I bought this suit and hat this morning at a small store I passed. I left the other suit at the cleaners, but uh, I went over it thoroughly first. All I found was this. A calling card. Warren McAllister. No address or anything. This mean anything to you? Not a thing. I looked in the telephone book and found there is a Warren McAllister on East 81st Street. I thought maybe I was he, so I called up and asked for him, but whoever answered said Mr. McAllister was just leaving for the country and couldn't come to the phone. What do you want me to do? Find out who I am, if you can, and especially find out whether or not I'm a criminal. Come on, Nick, we've got nothing better to do. Why don't you help him out? All right. First, what's the girl's name and address? Her name is Laura David. She lives at 7684 Windsor Road. And what about the doctor? Well, Miss David called him Dr. Bourne. That's all I know about him. And why'd you leave your other suit to be cleaned? Here's the claim check for it. I- I'm sure he won't find anything. You never can tell. Where are you going to be? I don't know, but I'll let you know as soon as I get settled. Very well, Mr. Powell. Meanwhile, Patsy and I'll start by calling on Miss Laura David. Apartment 3D, David. Well, he told us the truth about this, anyway. Come in. Riley, what are you doing here? I was just going to ask you that. What do you know about her? 
About who? The dame who rents this apartment, wise guy. We never even heard of her until half an hour ago, Lieutenant. Oh, you don't say. You just dropped in to pass the time of day, I suppose. We came to see her about a client of ours. Hey, look here, Riley. What's this all about? And why are you here? Right now, I am asking the questions. What's the name of this client of yours? He told us his name was John Powell. And what did he want you to do for him? He wanted us to find out who he is. He has amnesia from a sock on the head. Oh, so that's what that note meant. Well, what note's that, Riley? Uh, we found it on the table here. The hundred dollar bill pinned to it. Here it is. Dear Miss David, thanks for all you've done. I can impose on your hospitality no longer. Please reimburse both the doctor and yourself for any expense you've been put to on my account. Gratefully yours, John Powell. Well, doesn't say much. Yeah, the David girl will tell us what it means once we start working on it. Why, where is she? In the jug. Oh. A cop on the beat found her trying to hide a gun in an ash can on her way to work this morning. He brought her and the gun down to headquarters. She claims she found it on her steps last Friday night and was trying to get rid of it. Well, maybe she's telling the truth, Riley. People do that, you know. Uh, Anything wrong with the gun? Plenty. In the first place, it was a Swedish gun, a Bofors thirty-two caliber. Now, you just don't find them on your doorstep. In the second place, we checked it and found it was the gun used to knock off a stiff who was killed near the waterfront last Friday night. Oh, is that so? So you better kick in with what you know about this so-called client of yours. Well, I'd be glad to let you talk with him, Riley, but I don't know where to find him. For the love of... You got a client and you don't know where to find him? Just as soon as he gets in touch with us, we'll let you know. In the meantime, how about letting us talk to the David girl? Sure, sure. Anything I can do for you, Mr. Carter, will be a pleasure. Even though you won't do nothing for me. Come on. Well, Patsy, we certainly didn't get much out of that David girl. No, she just told us the same thing she told Riley. Oh, yes, uh, please. We want to see the suit this check calls for. Oh, oh yes, sure, for just a minute. I'll get it for you. I ain't sent it out yet. I uh, knew that stuff on it was blood. Uh, said he had an accident, if it is. Thanks. No. No. Pockets all empty. Hmm. Just as he said they were. No labels. He... Uh-oh. Look here, Patsy. A hole right through pocket, lining cloth, and everything. Mm, smells of powder, too, Nick. Yes. He fired the gun right through the pocket. Didn't have time to draw it. Nick, is is this part of the lining of the jacket, or is it something in the lining? Let me see. Here. Feels like something in the lining, I should say. Yes. There's a hole in the pocket here. A second. Ah, here it is. But what is it, Nick? It's one of these small labels you paste on your baggage, showing the ship you sailed on. Oh. This one came from the Abercrombie. Well, does that help? It may. We'll find out later. Well, that's all we can do here. Now let's call on Mr. McAllister. The uh, lieutenant is expecting you in the library. Hey, Nick, what did you... Hold it, Patsy. We'll find out fast enough. Well, what took you so long, Nick? Did you get a flat tire, maybe? Thanks for the welcome, Riley. What's going on here? As if you didn't know. But I don't. Well, Riley, what is it? Uh-oh. Look there, Nick. Is that McAllister? Yes, it's McAllister. And dead as a doornail. And don't tell me you don't know nothing about it, because I wouldn't believe it. Well, so McAllister is dead, too. How is this going to affect Nick's efforts to learn who John Powell really is? Or does John Powell know more about this than he's told Nick? We'll see in just a moment. Folks have a habit of forgetting to use the doormat, whether they come home through winter snow and spring rain or from summertime swimming pools. And the water they track in certainly spoils the appearance of shining, freshly clean floors. But those floors look spick and span again in a twinkling when you keep them protected with Linux clear gloss varnish because it keeps both dirt and water right there on the surface where they're easy to whisk away. That same protective finish gives sparkling beauty to woodwork and furniture as well. For Linux Clear Gloss has a gleaming, transparent luster that provides a background of distinction for all your household things. And how Linux Clear Gloss wears. It resists damage by hot grease, boiling water, fruit acids, perfume, even alcohol. 
which means it's as fine for use on tabletops as for wood floors and linoleum. What's more, Linex clear gloss varnish is so easy, so smooth to brush on that it's no job at all. And once applied, it gives your home the handsome, well-kept appearance in which you take such pride. So ask your dealer now for Linex, L-I-N-X, Linex clear gloss varnish. You'll find all three great Linex home brighteners and Chemtone, the miracle wall finish, at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And now back to our story. We left Nick and Patsy facing an angry Lieutenant Riley who was accusing them of knowing more about the murder of Mr. McAllister than they pretended. Yes, it's McAllister and dead as a doornail. And don't tell me you don't know nothing about it because I wouldn't believe it. But we don't, Lieutenant, honest. Of course we don't. Now, what happened, Riley? He was just about to learn the details when you drove up. So we waited for you to join us. Well, thank you, Riley. I knew I could count on you to do the right thing. What? Why Watch you... your blood pressure, Lieutenant. I ought to throw you both in the clink for 99 years. All right, all right. Now, how about finding out what happened to McAllister? All right, all right. Now, you, you, chauffeur. Uh, yes, sir. What's your name? Barry, sir. All right, Barry. Tell us what you know about this, and don't leave nothing out. Well, I was driving Mr. McAllister home from the bank, and I stopped in front of the house, same as always. I was just going to get out and open the door for him when a man came up to me with a gun in his hand. He told me to keep my hands on the wheel and to look straight ahead, not to pay any attention to what I heard. Go on. What happened then? Well, I heard the car door open behind me. Mr. McAllister started to say something, and then I heard a shot. Then I heard a man say, come on, Mike, and they ran up the street. I turned around, saw Mr. McAllister slumped down in the back seat and two men running toward a car. Where was this other car? In the middle of the block on the other side of the street. The men got in, and it drove off. You got any idea who them men were, what they was after? Oh, no, sir. All right, Barry. It's all for you for now. But don't go away. We may want you again in a few minutes. Oh, sure, Lieutenant. I'll stick around. Uh, You? What's your name? Well, what do you know about this? Uh, The name is Stovell, Lieutenant. I'm, uh, I was Mr. McGillis's butler, sir. Well, just a moment. Stover, did a man named John Powell call here today? Uh, Yes, sir, he did. Just as Mr. McAllister was leaving, sir. Uh, But Mr. McAllister said he didn't know anyone by that name, so he didn't speak to him. Did you recognize the voice? Uh, No, sir. But I'm almost sure it was the same person who called about an hour ago and asked if Mr. McAllister had returned yet. I told him I expected him in about half an hour. I asked him his name, sir, but he hung up. So, Mr. Detective Carter, this guy Powell didn't just happen to call you two up and tell you he knocked off this guy too now, did he? He couldn't have called us, Lieutenant. We haven't been back to the office since we left you. Then how did you happen to show up here just when you did then? We found McAllister's card in Powell's wallet. That's right, Lieutenant. Powell asked us to see if McAllister knew anything about him, who he might really be. I'd sure like to get a look at this client of yours. He seems to have a finger in every murder that goes on around here. You wouldn't let me just take a little peek at him, would you, Nicky? Just for the sake of our long and lovely friendship. Riley, I mean it. I haven't the slightest... Hey, what's going on? Nick, there goes McAllister's show. I told that guy to stick around here. Uh, He'll be right back, sir. He's just taking the car round to the garage on the next avenue, the same as he always does when it's not being used. But we got to go over that car for fingerprints as soon as my men get here. I'll go get him. I'll have him back here before you can say John Joseph Michael Riley. Stover. What do you know about that chauffeur, Barry? Why, not much, sir. He came to work here about three months ago. Uh, Mr. McAllister hired him himself. Did you see any part of what happened when Mr. McAllister was shot? Uh, Just the end, sir. I heard the car drive up and I went to open the door. Just as I did, I heard a shot and saw the two men start toward the other car. And Barry was sitting in the front seat, the way he said? Yes, sir. He was sitting there with his hands on the wheel. As soon as the men started running, he called me, and I went to see how badly Mr. McAllister was hurt. I see. Oh, by the way, Stover, do you happen to know where the chauffeur Barry lives? I think he has a room over in the next avenue, sir. Uh, Number 7612, I believe it is. It's over a bakery. Thank you. Well, Patsy, I think that's all for us here. Where to now, Nick? I think we'll take a trip down to the waterfront. I want to call on the purser of the Abercrombie. Uh, Did you say the Abercrombie, sir? Why, yes, why? It's probably only a coincidence, sir, but Mr. McAllister was very much worried last Friday night because a man he was expecting on the Abercrombie failed to show up. That's so? Who was this chap who didn't show up? I don't know, sir. 
Uh, Mr. McAllister was looking forward to seeing him. He was bringing him something important, I believe. He sent his car down to the pier to meet him, but Barry reported that he wasn't on the boat. Was Mr. McAllister interested in anything besides his bank? Oh, yes, sir. He was the head of several committees which were acting against enemy propaganda in this country. Combating enemy propaganda, huh? Oh, this thing is beginning to make sense, Patsy. Now I'm more anxious than ever to talk to the purser of the Abercrombie. Will you tell the purser I'd like to see him, please? This doesn't look like an American ship, Nick, even though it is named the Abercrombie. It isn't, Patsy. It was originally the Prince Knut, a Danish vessel. It was oh. taken over by the English when Hitler rolled over Denmark. Now oh. sails for Sweden, I believe. You think that the label we found in John Powell's clothes may mean that he came in on this boat? I hope so, Patsy. And there's another thing makes me think that may be true. The gun that Miss David found, the one that Powell must have dropped on the steps of her apartment house, was a Swedish gun, remember? Yes. A Bofors, 32. Mr. Carter, you want to talk to me, yes? Yes. Was there a passenger on your boat this last trip by the name of John Powell? John Powell? Uh, no, we have only three young gentlemen traveling alone. I remember well uh, one Swedish-American, Mr. Lars Sjostrom from Michigan, one Norwegian, Mr. Halverson, and the young South American, Mr. Richard Vallon. Richard Vallon, huh? Doesn't sound much like Powell, Nick. You are from the police, maybe? Well, yes, in a way. Why? Uh, then I think maybe this Mr. Vallon could be the one you are looking for. We had trouble with him on the way. What kind of trouble? Oh, it was not serious. Just uh, his room steward reported to me that he was armed, that he had seen pistol on his dresser. So I call on him and ask him to give me pistol for the trip. It is rules, you know. Yes, I understand. But he did not want to give it to me. He talked about it for a long time. Then at last he gave it to me and I put it in safe. And then we dock, I give it back to him. Very interesting. Did you notice the make of it? Oh, yes. It was Bofors, 32 caliber. The Bofors, 32. Could you describe this Richard Vallon for me? Uh, he was a young man, slender, good-looking, a blonde hair, about my size. That's Powell, all right, Nick. Oh, Purser, did you happen to notice if a car met him at the dock? Uh, yes, when he leaved the boat. He get into big black limousine, they start away, and then about the block from the dock, the car stop again... It was too dark to see what was happening. I think maybe there was trouble with the engine because I hear a backfire and then the car go on again. But that was the same place where police find dead man next morning. Nick, it all adds up, doesn't it? Yes, Patsy, I think it does. Well, thanks for your trouble, Purser. Oh, it's no trouble, thank you. Patsy, I think we'll have a look at this room where Mr. McAllister's chauffeur lives. <laughs> Do you expect to find Barry here, Nick? I rather hope not. I'd like to get a look at his room without his knowing it. Oh. Are you looking for someone? Yes. We have an appointment with Barry, Mr. McAllister's chauffeur. He told us to come here and wait for him. Said you'd unlock his door so we could wait inside. I don't unlock no rumor's door for no strangers. Oh, yes, you do. See this? Uh, oh, sure, sure. Sure, I'll open it for you. You don't have to act like that about it, though. Go ahead, open up. Is it on this floor? Yeah, right over here. There you are. Hurry up, will you? Well, sit down inside here where I can see you. Okay. That's it. All right, Patsy, shut the door. Okay. Now, let's see what we can find here. Hey, look. Hurry up, will you? I got work to do. I can't sit here forever. You'll sit there till we finish this search. Nick, what do you suppose is in this little can? I can't open it. Huh? Hey, Patsy, let me have that. Yes, mm -hmm. Yes, the cover is on pretty tight. Well, that's movie film, isn't it? Certainly is. Now, well, let's see. Oh, boy, look at that. Well, what is it, Nick? Looks like pictures of German atrocities and destruction in some of the conquered countries. Oh. Oh, these are brutal... What did you find this, Betsy? In the bottom drawer, wrapped up in some long underwear. There's a briefcase there, too. Briefcase? Let me see it. Here it is. Yes, that's it, all right. 
Come on, Patsy. No, but Nick... No time to lose. We're going to take this stuff down to Riley to be turned over to the FBI. They'll be very happy to get it. Maybe they would, but they ain't gonna... Barry! Now, Carter, take a look at this gun of mine and then hand over the film and the briefcase. I'll take care of them myself. Barry, I'd like to make a deal with you. Yeah? What kind of a deal? I want... <coughs> Excuse me, do you mind if I get my handkerchief? Never mind the funny business. Give me the stuff you found here. Very well. Here. <coughs> May I get my handkerchief? All right, but I'm watching you, so don't try anything. I don't carry any guns in my breast pocket. I just... <laughs> just want my handkerchief. There. Hey, what was that? Why, you... you... Oh. All right, Patsy. You can stop holding your breath now. We get out of here fast. Find a cop and bring him up here quick. Right, Nick. Gee, I'm glad I realized what you were doing in time, so I didn't get knocked out, too. That little flask of quick-acting knockout gas comes in handy sometimes. Now, my unconscious friend, I'll just collect the film and the briefcase and turn them over to Riley to be forwarded to the FBI. They'll be glad to get evidence like this. Barry was only working for McAllister so he could keep an eye on him, huh? Yes, Riley. McAllister was very active in combating enemy propaganda. And Barry was on the other side. Mm -hmm. I believe that as soon as he, Barry, found out the names of the men McAllister was working with, he had him killed. Well, with the pictures and other data in that briefcase, the FBI should be able to make short work of the whole crew. Yeah. Oh. Lieutenant Riley, homicide speaking. Oh, sure, sure. Send him right in. Something interesting, Riley? It yeah, could be. Well, Schultz? I was on my beat tonight when a big car goes around the corner fast and the guy falls out. Lands with his head up against one of the L-pillars, out cold. I got an ambulance and took him to the hospital. Well? Well, I, I found these things on him, Lieutenant. That's why I come direct to you. Mm. Nick, Powell's lavalier and eardrop. Yes, and there's McAllister's card and all the money. You mean that guy could be John Powell? Certainly could be, Riley. So he wasn't no crook, eh? Well, this sure looks like it. Well, I'm sure he wasn't, Riley. I am going to the hospital and have a look at that guy. You want to come? Right you are. Grab your hatchet, Patsy, and let's get going. Nick, when you ride with the police department, you don't have to watch out for traffic or red lights or anything. That's more, you save gas when you don't use your own car. That's about right. it. Calling Lieutenant Riley. Headquarters yeah. calling Lieutenant uh, that, Riley. That calls for me. Hold everything. Schultz. Schultz, this is Lieutenant Riley. Go ahead. We just got a call from the guy we took to the hospital last night, Lieutenant. He says he saw a car used by McAllister's killers. Says car license is KX. 56-7D. I checked that number and it belongs to Gussie Lang. Gussie Lang? Schultz, send out some men at once and pick up Gussie and his gang and bring him in and hold him for question and get going fast. That's all. Right, Lieutenant. I'll take care of him fast enough. Well, step on it, Race. What's holding you back? So, Powell, you actually saw McAllister killed last night. Yes, plain as I see you now. I was waiting for him to come home in the hopes that he could identify me. When the killers started off, I jumped on the rear bumper of their car, but when they went around a corner, I got thrown off. Hit something, I guess. You hit your head on an L pillar. Best cure in the world for amnesia. Practically never fails, Mr. Vallon. Vallon? How'd you know my name? I only knew it myself a few minutes ago. We find out things. Now, suppose you tell us what happened when you landed off the Abercrombie last Friday night. That is, if you can remember now. I remember, all right. I got off the boat, and McAllister's chauffeur met me. We drove a block or so from the dock, and he stopped. Two men opened the car door and started to get in. I saw they had guns, so I fired at one of them. Then something hit me on the head, and that's the last I knew. Now, look here, Powell or Valen or whatever your name is. Where'd you get all that money we found on you? Them sparklers. They don't look honest to me. The jewels belonged to my great-aunt Miriam. I took them across to have them recut in Amsterdam. Then the Germans took Amsterdam, so I had to bring them back. Mm. The money belonged to a refugee I met who asked me to deposit it to my account until he could get over here. Mm -hmm. 
But I still don't see why those men tried to hold me up. Nobody knew I had the jewels with me. It wasn't the jewels they wanted, Valen. It was the roll of film and the envelope of documents you had in your briefcase. Were they important? Where did you get them? Well, a friend of my father's gave them to me. He asked me to give them to Mr. McAllister when I got over here. But what were they, Mr. Carter? The film showed Nazi atrocities in conquered countries. The documents were pictures, descriptions, and names of active workers in anti-American activities here in this country. McAllister's chauffeur, Barry, was one of the head workers. When you prevented those men from getting what they wanted, Barry dumped you out of the car and took the film and the papers to his room to hold until he could dispose of them safely. But we got there first. Well, Lieutenant, are you satisfied that Mr. Powell, or I should say Mr. Vallon, is innocent? Mm, yeah, yeah, I guess so. Oh, come on, Riley, cheer up. You've got the film and the anti-American data, you've got McAllister's murderers, yeah. and you're going to get all the credit for solving the case. Huh? What more do you want? In just a moment, Nick and Patsy will bring you a preview of next week's exciting case. But before they do, think this over. The more home-like the place you live in, the more fun you have inviting folks to share your hospitality. And these days, every home can look its shining best with very little effort when you depend on the three great Linux home brighteners. Take Linux cream polish, for instance. In one quick, easy application, it reveals your fine furniture in all its original gleaming beauty, renews the appearance of the wood, frees it from the dull cloudiness of dust, old polish, and finger marks. You see, Linux cream polish actually cleans as it polishes, cutting your job in half, saving one whole step. And when you're through, you'll find that Linux cream polish has left no oiliness on the surface of your furniture. It dries hard, bright, and dustless. Yes, in every way, Linux cream polish for fine furniture is the modern shortcut to furniture loveliness. Be sure to ask your dealer for it by name. Linux cream polish for fine furniture, which cleans as it polishes. You'll find all three great Linux home brighteners, Linux self-polishing wax, Linux clear gloss varnish, and Linux cream polish at your nearest hardware, paint, or department store. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. Well, Nick, how about a peek into next week's story? Got a few hints for us? Well, next week's story, Ken, is about one of the wildest and most exciting nights Patsy and I ever spent. I should say it was. What happened, Nick? Four rich old Tories during the Revolution buried all their valuables in a small rocky island. Their heirs had found a clue to the burial place of the treasure and called me in to solve the clue which was in code. But they didn't figure on the one man who wanted it all for himself and who was willing to kill to be sure he got it. What do you call the story, Nick? It's called Four Rings of Death. Or the Mystery of the Tory Island Murders. I hope you'll be with us next week. So long for now. So long to all of you. See you soon. And so long to both of you, Nick and Patsy. We'll be here waiting for you next week. Next week at this same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, entitled... Four Rings of Death. For Nick Carter and the mystery of the Tory Island murders. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is featured in Street and Smith magazines. Lon Clark is starred as Nick with Helen Choate as Patsy. Original music is played by Lou White and the programs are written and directed by Jock McGregor. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented at this time and over these same stations each week by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss varnish, Linux cream polish, and Linux self-polishing wax, created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme fine quality paints. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linux dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. This is Mutual. Mutual.